Welcome to Reread, where I'm rereading through the expanded universe in chronological order. Folks, we are back at Jude Watson's Last of the Jedi series. It's book one, The Desperate Mission. Uh, the first time going through these, as you know, I did not like them. I am trying to go in there with an open mind. So, this one, where does it start off? Well, uh, Obi-Wan is on Tatooine. He's picking up gossip here and there, and he hears the name Ferris Olin, a name he hasn't heard in years. And he feels like he has to go save. Ferris Olin. You know, Ferris is in trouble. He must go save him. That's what he does. He's a Jedi. He does get to talk to Obi-Wan. This takes place uh, after uh, the Dark Lord rise of Darth Vader because he has just recently, it said, maybe in the past few days or a few weeks, he's heard from Qui-Gon. And he doesn't hear from him frequently, uh, but he, hear, he, he talks to Qui-Gon every once in a while now. And it talks about his experience. I thought... This was also where he saw Darth Vader for the first time again, but it was not. Uh, after reading it, uh, that event took place in the Rise of Darth Vader book, but not in The Desperate Mission. Jude Watson uh, took note of that and uh, uh, made, it, made it seem uh, flawless in its continuity. Again, this is why the EU is so great for me. And so now he knows, you know, Darth Vader's Anakin. He's kind of upset by that. He talks to Qui-Gon about what should I do? And Qui-Gon's like, well, you know what to do, right? What does the Force tell you? You know, use, use your feelings. And so he's like, well, I should save Ferris. And I'm like, well, here's the deal. You know that you have to stay and guard Luke. It hasn't been, you haven't been on Tatooine that long. And you're still worried something may happen to him. Or maybe stormtroopers will find him. You know, or Darth Vader will find him. It's way too early to leave the planet, especially for someone who left the Jedi Order prior to Clone Wars. Yes, here I go. I don't think Ferris Olin is that important. In fact, when he goes to visit the Eleven, which is the secret underground group that Ferris Olin started, he is shocked to find out that people are saying that they love Ferris. Truly, they love Ferris. Not just that they respect him because every kid looked up to him in the academy, but he just didn't have any friends. Well, now he has all the friends in the world, and he's funny, and he's laid back, and he's now perfect. So even that one little thing that Jude Watson made up about, yeah, you can see I, I don't like Ferris Olin. No, but seriously, the one thing that she said, oh, Ferris is perfect in everything, but he can't make friends. Well, now he's perfect in everything, and he can make friends now. He's gotten better since he left the Jedi Order. In fact, the whole time, uh, Obi-Wan's saying, hey, you need to use the Force. You need to use the Force. You can, you're still a Jedi. You can still be a Jedi. I don't know why he's you know, just uh, hard-pressed on getting Ferris Olin to pick up the Jedi ways again when he's telling everyone, go into hiding. But uh, Ferris Olin's like, no, I can't, I can't. And then he does. And of course, Ferris Olin is just perfect. And I, I don't know, maybe I sound like Anakin Skywalker talking about him. I do not like the character of Ferris Olin. Now, thankfully, this one is mainly focused on Obi-Wan. Obi-Wan meets Trevor Flume, who's going to be a big character in it. And Trevor's okay. You don't know, I mean, he's like the little street urchin. His parents died during the Clone Wars, and he's stealing, you know, and getting by any way he can, kind of like a lad. Ferris does note that Obi-Wan has gone gray now. So it seems like Obi-Wan went gray very quickly, which is fine. Like I said, I'm, fi I'm fine with him aging quickly. I've, I've seen people after a year or so go completely gray. Uh, it just kind of comes up and happens to you all of a sudden. And some of my friends have had that happen to them as well. Uh, but he does shave his beard because he has to go undercover as a stormtrooper. So he has to shave his beard. Now, it is growing back at the end of the book, they say. But I found that interesting. I do not remember that he shaved. It's only one line. He had to shave his beard so, you know, it, he wouldn't have a beard sticking out of the Stormtrooper outfit, which is correct. You don't need that. That would kind of tip people off. Now, when he finally finds Ferris Olin in hiding, uh, the Imperials who are looking for him send out a message that if he doesn't turn himself in, they're going to kill all the prisoners. And all the prisoners is a lot of people on the planet. So, Ferris feels like he has to turn himself in. And when he does, of course, the Imperial's like, well, looks like we're going to have to kill the prisoners anyway. But there's a big... Uh, one of the ladies who is helping the team, part of the Eleven, she works as a, a tailor or whatever. She makes clothes. And so she made prison outfits for every person on the planet or every person there at the ex exchange, prisoner exchange. And they suddenly take off their cloaks and everything goes crazy. And everyone's in a prison outfit, so you don't know who's who. And you can't just open fire on an entire city. you know. So that's how they kind of break Ferris out with all the commotion there. 
Uh, there is a High Inquisitor, uh, Mal Malarin, I think is his name. And not much is known about him. We don't get to see him that much. He has hired two bounty hunters. Uh, to go after them or, or chase after Ferris, and one of them is young Boba Fett. Now, we're not supposed to know that till the very end. It's supposed to be a big reveal, because Obi-Wan sees a fire spray ship. Well, back before Disney, you know, not many people knew that the Slave One was a fire spray vessel, you know? And so she's doing all these little tales, and Obi-Wan's like, something's familiar about this bounty hunter. And then it has wrist, wa wa ri wrist wa rockets that fires at it. But you're not supposed to know it's young Boba Fett to the very end until Obi-Wan sees him and goes, that looks like a young Jango, but he's got green armor. Oh my goodness, Jango had a son. That's Boba Fett. And, and it's funny because when Ferris is going, so who's this fat guy? He's like, he's, it's his son. He said, he's got to be about 14 years old now. And you're terrified of him. 14 year old. And it says he's smaller. It looks like a smaller version of Jango Fett. This is ridiculous. Um, I, I, again, I don't like young Boba Fett bounty hunter. Obviously, from the young adult book series and from what we know, yes, he was a bounty hunter for a little while until he took a break, I guess for three years, maybe, and you know, kind of went undercover and kind of honed his skills. I like the idea better of Boba Fett just disappearing and then showing up you know, in his 20s now as a skilled bounty hunter. We don't have to hear about, you know, maybe he didn't pick up the mantle till way later. But young Boba Fett, oh, look, it's Bounty Hunter Boba Fett. I knew him when he was a kid, when he was a little Bounty Hunter kid. Here's some pictures. I just don't like that. I don't like that. I don't know why Jude Watson thought it was a good idea. I mean, she knew about the young Boba Fett, you know, uh, book series and thought, oh, well, I can bring young Boba Fett in since, you know, everyone loves Boba Fett. Yeah, but not when he's a kid. And that Obi-Wan and Ferris are like, ter not terrified, but they're, oh no, you know, they're worried about him. He's a threat. He's a threat. I don't know. I, I, I just don't buy it. Now, it turns out that Trevor Flume had stolen something from Ferris's office that he thought it was a defunct droid, but that droid had a data drive in it that had the whole list of all the secret people who were part of the membership of the Eleven. And where, who'd you sell it to, Trevor? He went, uh, some kid wasn't a kid. That was Boba Fett. And I'm going, Ugh. it's almost as if uh, Jude Watson has lost her magic. I know there's a few people out there and a few uh, listeners and viewers who love Jude Watson's Last of the Jedi, but it feels so different from everything she's already written. Even Qui-Gon doesn't feel like Qui-Gon, if that makes sense. I, no one could write Qui-Gon better than Jude Watson, but here, when he speaks to Obi-Wan, which is not that much, it just doesn't sound that much like Qui-Gon. And, and you're missing that relationship between Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan, or just an Obi-Wan period, an Anakin adventure would be fun. But an Obi-Wan Ferris? No. Now, eventually they do escape the planet, and they're on pursuit uh, well, they're, they're, they're trying to get away from the bounty hunters. Uh, Obi-Wan doesn't want that grand, uh, the High Inquisitor to find out what happened to Padme Amidala, you know, because she may find out about the twins. And so it kind of ties to his mission on Tatooine to safeguard Luke. So this was a good thing he came. So Jude Watson realized, yeah, him just going after Ferris Owen was probably kind of stupid, so let's tie it in. So I guess that's why he would leave the planet. And... Then it ends with, oh no, they see the fire spray. In any minute, Boba Fett's going to find them. It's a cliffhanger. Because I think the first two books came out at the same time. So, what about book two? Well, find out next time.